What This is an introduction to DNSSEC. Um, DNSSEC is, uh, I'm going to explain what it is, why we need it, um, a little bit on the details, the technical details. Um, if you want to do hands-on stuff, it's not here, it's going to be tonight in the, work, uh, in the workshop tent. Why are you not allowed to have that? Come back with that question, because I, I, I think I don't understand the question. Okay, so we're going to talk about you in a second what? Um, why do we do this? Uh, I would like to write and see many uh, of you people probably know the right and see as the uh, regional IT registry, but it is in our charter that the technical projects that are, in, is in, are in the benefit of the uh, ISP community in the right area, which is Europe and the United countries. Um, within that scope, we do lots of things. We do test traffic, we, do, we look at routing stability, we provide um, uh, tools to, to basically see what the quality of the network is. We do a host count, uh, we have uh, another working on the, uh, We provide user delegation for the, for the numbers we, we, we allocate. And uh, within that context, we have the DZ project, which stands for Deployment of Internet Security Infrastructure. We try to focus on technologies that are um, need to be deployed on a wide scale, so it's not your firewall or intrusion detection tool or something else, but something that, if it's picked up by you know large set of ISPs, it might make the internet better. DNSSEC is the first thing we look at. Um, so that is why we do this. We want to raise awareness of DNSSEC because we think it's cool, basically. Um, it's for folks that do DNS and want to do DNS basically. What's the outline of the talk? Well, uh, you know, give a recap of playing on DNS. I kind of assume everybody knows what, what DNS is, but for those who don't, I'm going to start with that. I'm going to explain why we need DNS then I'm going to go into the details of the mechanisms that DNS provides to secure your zones or your DNSSEC operations, basically. Then the DNSSEC operations, what are the problems that you need to do to actually deploy the deployment, and there's some final words which, you know, don't have an adder to be caught on. What's a DNS? Well, everybody knows it. Domain name system. It's a distributed database uh, that, that you can use to resolve domain names or labels. It provides a, a mapping from labels into research records. There's several types of research records, address records, mail, host, text records, key records, well, the whole shebang. It's all there. Um, and research records are, start, are stored basically in the zone. The system is highly scalable, you know that. And just for fun, um, you all know that uh, the internet scales. We, I said we do a host count. This is an example of the host count. We do this every month. Um, in 1990, uh, there were 30,000 hosts in the right area. That's basically Europe. Uh, Middle East, North Africa, former Soviet Union. Now, um, as of June 2001, there's 15 million homes. The DNS was already around in 1990. It's still around now, which means it's, it scales pretty good. Where the DNS sits in a tree. You start off with the root, dot. Then you go to com, to net, you know, you, you basically build a whole tree structure underneath it. Um, I, I tree here, you know, I kept Unix here. Um, the only reason I run the Windows is because of the nice games you can play there, but also because of PowerPoint. And if somebody has a open software tool to do animations and presentations, please see me. Um, so I can get rid of that. Um, so this is the DNS tree. Um, basically, you have domains. A domain is everything that is under a certain label, and you have zones. And sometimes people mix them up, but just, just, to, just to repeat that, a zone is, is an administrative unit within a domain. It's everything which is basically sitting in a zone. This is the DNS data. This is basically what it looks like. It's an example zone file. It's my uh, play domain, basically. 
Um, what's important is that it's ordered like this. You have a label. It's a TTL. Uh, TTL is needed to, to, to do caching on the internet successfully. Um, it basically says how long information may live in caches before it's thrown away. There's a class that it basically always defaults to in. It's the only thing we use on the internet at the moment. And you have the, uh, the, the resource data, the R data. The R data is dependent on what kind of uh, uh, resource record type you have. Um, and that's all specified in RCs. If you have a certain type of record, the R data is specified in RCs. This is basically how, um, can somebody shrink the screen a little bit because there's some information on the. This is basically how VNS Resolver works. You have a resolver in your local machine um, which asks a, a certain question. So I want to know the web server from RightNet and I ask the address. Normally, this is a stub resolver. This is your, you know, your system uh, doing this baked in the kernel. It will go out to a caching forward. It's the, the caching forward is the thing you configure in your uh, result.com, for instance. And ask the question to the caching forward. The caching forward will, will first look in its cache to see if that information is available. If it's not, it will go to the root server and actually ask to the root server, can you provide me with the address of right.net? Um, if it doesn't work, don't bother. Um, Root server answers, no, I don't have that. Go to the next server. Go to a generic top-level domain server and ask the same question. Um, it, it will get some glue to uh, glue its information so that the caching forwarder actually knows where to find the GTLD server. Uh, the caching forwarder will ask this information to the GTLD server. will catch the information about the location of that GTLD server. The GTLD server, so the top-level domain server, will as, uh, answer the thing and say, okay, I don't know this. I have all the information about the net, go to the right name server. And the right name server, of course, knows the answer, will provide that answer. The, uh, the answer will go back to, uh, to the client asking it, and uh, the, the answer will either be added to the cache. This is basically how DNS resolver uh, resolving goes. So we have. We've seen the result for part now, where does DNS data live on the internet? Well, you start off by creating a zone file. The zone files live on disks, I guess. Um, zone files are then uploaded to your master server, to your, your name server. And the data there is replicated to slave servers, secondary servers also. Another way to introduce data into the system is using dynamic updates. You cannot read that, but that's something which is happening there. Um, Windows 2000 is quite famous for doing dynamic updates. <laughs> um, if you like it or not. This part of the system is basically the server side. This is what you control. This is your environment. Then on the other side, we have the, um, well, the, the clients. The resolvers asking the caching forwarders. The caching forward is going over the internet and asking data to, to, to slave and master servers. And that's the client side of things. And that's basically the, where the data really lives. So where is the vulnerabilities? I use the same slide, that's, this is handy. You can corrupt data. If you have access to the zone file, you can actually, you know, change it. There's not much you can do about that with the NSSEC. If you don't protect your system from, from, from people corrupting your zone data, you're lost. You can do unauthorized updates. Well, that's a little bit harder. You don't have control over all the clients in your network. They might try to do unauthorized uh, updates. This is a problem, for instance, here. If you want to update, you know, you provide the, the name of your laptop to the, the HAL 201 name server using dynamic updates, well, everybody can do that. And you might, you know, put unauthorized stuff in the, in the, in the zone code. Much more what you can do. You can impersonate the master. If you spoof the, the master address, the uh, address of the master server, the secondary might query that the, those spoof master servers for uh, for updates of the zone subfiles they share and get corrupted data. This is a nasty one. And that sits on the internet. And some caching forwarders will ask the, the real ser the master server, some will ask the slaves. So there is polluted data there and it gets to the caching forward. And of course you may do cache pollution by data spoofing. If you, if you are in a land, it's very easy to do that. 
do it. If you are in a, a, a shared medium like here, I can look for uh, data between the results and the caching forwarders, or just uh, the, the data going from the caching forwarders to, to the internet, and just replace the answers. So that, that's really trivial on a, a shared uh, local area network. It's a little bit uh, more difficult if the data is somewhere on the backbone. But I think that's possible. I think you can go into, you know, somewhere near the backbone and spool PNS traffic there. And then you have a chance that you pollute uh, huge caches. And if something lives in a cache and the TTL is long enough, well, it's hard to get rid of it. So these are the um, things that um, DNSSEC provides. You cannot really read what's in the balloons, but it's the same stuff as, uh, as, as I was just a minute ago. Um, you have server protection mechanisms to basically protect you from uh, the master slave uh, um, um, uh, data replication and to protect you from unauthorized dynamic updates. And you have, um, that's the second part, you have beta data protection that protects the data that lives in the DNS. How is that implemented? Um, well, as I said, you have data, uh, server authentication, basically, that's, that's something I, uh, as I mentioned. That, that you do using TSIG, which is a shared secret, um, and I'll, I'll show you in a bit. The data um, uh, authentication and integrity is done with public key cryptography. And I think that if you talk to most people about DNSSEC, the they forget the TSIG bit. Uh, the TSEC part of the NSSEC. Most people refer to the public key part as the NSSEC. So that's also what I will concentrate in the talk. Uh, oh yeah. So you want to do this for protecting your, your, your DNS, but when doing this, there's a nice opportunity here. You can use the DNS to, to, to basically build a globally distributed database of keys. Um, I find it hard to use the word PTI, but actually you build a PTI. If you listen to the, the talk by uh, Hugh Daniels and, and John Gilmore um, a few hours ago, uh, they want to use the DNS and DNSSEC on top of it to build uh, opportunistic encryption in IPsec. You ask the DNS for a key, and you can access it there, and you're, because of security in the DNS, you know that the data is real. It comes from a real place. That's cool. The set mechanisms. The <laughs> uh, set mechanisms to authenticate servers. Well, that's trans transaction signatures. Basically, what you do, I share a secret with somebody else, and every time I talk to a server, we 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 basically authenticate the message by by using that shared secret. That doesn't scale. I mean, shared secrets don't scale. You have to distribute them, and they, you know, that, that doesn't really scale. But if you are primary and you have several secondaries running on the internet, use TSIG. It works. It's there now. You can implement it. It's, it's trivial to do. Um, and you don't have to deploy other features like the, the public key part to do it. So. Everything which was on the, uh, on the left hand side of my slide just a minute ago, you can do now with TC. Um, this is all I'm going to say about TSIC, except that um, TSIC has uh, uh, features built in to prevent uh, replay attacks. If you use TSIC, you better use NTP, otherwise, you'll, you'll find your zone transfers failing. Well, if the clocks are out for more than five minutes or so. Not that. So we're now at the, the place where it becomes interesting with respect to public key cryptography. I mean, using that. Um, this is on one page, so I'm going to go further into this. In a sec, uh, what you basically do is you sign research records. You do that using a private key, and this, the signatures can be verified using public keys. Um, it's the SIG and the key research record. And you can... Um, Delegate authority for signing and build a chain of trust by um, signing over delegations. I sign my child's key, and by having that the signature of the child's keys, 
you can uh, you delegate down the tree. I'll, I'll, I'll go into more details in a bit. Um, and in the ideal case, you only need one public key. That's the, the key of the root. We're very far from that happening. But if, if DNSSEC is, is really deployed, there's only one key to be changed. Key it's being, key it's going root. to be pretty disturbing. That key will be published every day in CNN or whatever. You need that in a, I don't know. So we have two new uh, research records, for SIG records, that contains a signature over a research record set, and a, a key record, which is a public key. You need that to very tight earlier. What was changed? There's another research record which is introduced in the NSF, that's the next record, and that's used for internal consistency, of, uh, to check on the internal consistency of zone files, and basically check that it's certain information is actually not there. We have an authentic, uh, authenticated denial of existence for records in the DNS. Um, for nonce DNS set keys, there is a third record where you can put certificates in. Um, it's often uh, mentioned as a as DNS set use, but it's basically a, 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 a research record to store information. Key records contain data that's important for the infrastructure for the DNS, but might also contain other types of keys, like applications key, applications key, SSH key, IPsec keys, well, you name it. Everything that might have use, might use a key, it could go in the key record. And that presents a problem, um, which I'll go into in a bit. Excuse me? I say key, yeah, of course. Um, everybody here knows what public key cryptography is. Yeah, I'll speak this one. I feel um, Well, you also know that, you know, mathematical is unique, but one way problem. Anyway, just, just, just remove. I, I, I have more, less time than I have. But anyway, this is how a key research record, uh, what a key research record looks like. Uh, you start with the labels, the TTL, uh, then the class, then the research record type. And then there's a couple of, uh, uh, of, of, of data points there. Some flags to, to just communicate some extra information. There's a protocol field, there's an algorithm field. Uh, protocol three means uh, in a sec, uh, algorithm three means that you use uh, DSA, I think, for, uh, for as an algorithm for the public key stuff. And this is a basically for a representation of, of, of the key. Um, for most people who uh, use uh, uh, mainly uh, for bind um, configuration, note, note that this, this bracket is used to, to do multi-line um, um, configuration in here. Normally, everything fits in one line in your zone files. Um, to use brackets, you can use multiple lines. Do you have a question? Uh, is there an algorithm uh, defined for using a little curve uh, uh, for DNSSEC? Um, there is at least a drop, and I'm, the, al the algorithm number four is reserved for it. I'm not. I'm pretty sure it's not been implemented yet. Um, actually, uh, new protocols, uh, sorry, new algorithms are implemented. Uh, basically, uh, over the, the, the past time. Uh, we started off with RSA uh, MD5, and using MD5 hashes, and there's already a draft to use the more secure uh, SHA-1 uh, uh, hash with the... With the with all those graphics or something that is... Um, hmm? use a graphic, just to recap for the next slide. What's important is that a signature, signature is made over a research record set, and a research record set <laughs> is all the data with the same label, the same plus, the same TTL, or the, the TTL is defined to be the same, um, and the same um, um, Q type. Everything which is there. A signature is always made over all the data with that, those properties. So um, if you have multiple A records here, the signature is made over those two records together. You can, if you have two records there, you cannot sign only one. You always set it, sign a complete set of records. But if you have, for instance, a set of keys, you always sign them together. 
And if there's an application key between those keys, you have all those keys using, which you use for the zone delegation authority of, of, of zone data. There's an application key in between there. You, have, you sign that key as well if you, if you do the sign. So if you have a, um, an application that changes keys all the time, you have to re-sign the whole key set for that. This is the SIG. It's much more information in there. We started with the label, then the, uh, the TL again. Um, the SIG says, I am the signature of the A record, recent record set for, for the web server. So this is a SIG over www.brightlet.net, A, whatever the address is. A, whatever the second address is. A, whatever the third address is. Then it says, again, uh, algorithm, uh, which is used for signing the number of labels covered. It's three labels which are uh, covered here, www.write.net. Um, this bit is there to uh, make wildcards possible. I have not seen an impl uh, implementation yet of DNS second wildcards. The original TTL is there. If things are cached and you get it from a cache, you don't know the original TTL. And the signature is made of the data with the complete TTL in there. So you have to first restore the original TTL be before you can do verification. Then there is a signature uh, expiration and incitation time, a validity period for which this key, uh, signature is valid. In the NSEC, there's no way to get rid of keys. If they're there, they're there. The only thing that expires is a, is a signature. There's no key revocation mechanism. Somebody compromised your key, it can be used forever. The only thing that you can do to prevent that is to have the signature of your parent be replaced by another signature, making the chain of trust in trust. Then the next label here, the three, uh, uh, 3112, that's the key tag of the original, the, the key that made the designing. The key tag is just an ID so that you can quickly find it when you, when you search for it. And write.net is uh, the pointer to where you can find the key, the public key with which this signature was made. So I query for write.net key, I get a bunch of keys there, and I select key with key tag 3112. And then I can verify uh, this signature, just get it from the DM. And the rest is the uh, is, uh, basic for uh, uh, encrypted uh, or decoded uh, signature. Then we have the next data, uh, the next record. Which is used to um, um, to do authenticated denial of, um, of existence. The next data basically says between www.write.net and Apex, there's no data. The write.net says this is the next record in my zone. You first sort the zone alphabetically. And then you point to the next record in the zone file. And if you're at the end, at the bottom, you point back to the top. If I query for www.write.net, which in alphabetically order is below here, then I get an answer that says there's no such, do there's no such domain. And I, it's not there because, and I get back that this next record. <laughs> By that, I, authentic, uh, I have an authenticated denial that something doesn't exist there. And it also says that for www.write.net, there's four, um, there's an A record, research record, the SIG research record, and the next research record. So nobody can say, I want the MX record for www.write.net or something. I'm not going to go further in detail of next time. Unless my slides come to the Okay, so we have the tool back basically. And okay. now we're going to deploy this. Um, and I'm first going to do what is easy deploy this in your own organization. That can be done already. You don't have to. Um, it's fairly easy. Um, basically, you, you're, you're the master of your own zones in your own organization. And you want to get those signed. How do you do that? Well, basically, you get your zone file, and you sign it. And using the bind tools that will sort the zone, uh, zone file for you, it will sort the next record, 
and we'll sign this stuff by inserting net, uh, six records for the data um, of, for each RR set. The signature is made with your private key. Your private key is somewhere in this. You can then careful not to do that. Well, that's with every public key. And then um, you distribute your public key to those that need to be able to trust your zone. Basically, you say, okay, I sign my zone with this private key. This is the public key. If you configure this in your resolver or in your testing forwarder, then you can, uh, can check my zone. You can, can validate that. That's fairly easy. You can do that today. And, and if you do that in a caching forwarder, uh, basically the caching forwarder, if you enable the DNS stack, will not uh, uh, um, hand uh, invalid answers to the resolver. You will be secure for that particular zone. You can set this up in your own organization. And uh, your friends can set it up, and you just have to exchange the public keys. You don't use the DNS for that. Basically, this is what it looks like in a, in a, a sort of uh, example. You, you, you put your trusted key in, in, in the corporate site 1, or in corporate site 3, or 2, or whatever. And, and then you can verify the data was in your local DNS. If you're distributed, this is the way to do that. Only problem is if you roll over, these people who have their their testing forward is configured with trusted key for my uh, for my thingy, for my for my zone. They have to uh, roll over those trusted keys as well. You have to inform them that you're going to change your key. And if they don't catch that, catch you changing your key, as soon as you start publishing new data, uh, uh, signed with a key that is not in this configuration file. The zone goes bad, and so you're invisible. <coughs> Basically, um, this is what happens. I have, you know, a, a number of zones which are signed, um, and I need to distribute those out of band if if these people want to do secure DNS to each other. Um, Let's get back to how um, um, a verification is done um, in, in the DNS, uh, what it looks like. Um, and from that we go to how it's built up over a zone tree. <coughs> Basically you verify that you can see that that's what we know. The DNS data is signed. If I have a record www.write.net with several uh, addresses behind that, there's a key there. And the, the, the indentation went wrong here. There's, there's, a, there's a signature there. <coughs> Here's a, an address record set containing two addresses. There's a sig over an address record set over www.write.net. I will let the origin out here. Um, well, timing parameters and such. And then it says write.net made this key. So what I do is um, I'm going to go back to write.net to, to, to check that. So I write on that, address record, signature made with the, with the address record, and this says, go back to write on that and ask the key. So I ask the key for write on that, I get a key. There's a signature over that key made by NET. I go back, I ask NET, may I have the key? NET says, yeah, the key is this. There's a signature made with the key, and it's signed by DOT. And for DOT, I have to trust the key on my disk. This is the IU situation. I go all the way up from dot, oops, I go all the way up, all the way up from dot, and I can verify the chain downwards. This is the ideal situation. This is some yarding you can use. Um, you have verifiable secure. That means you can walk the tree all the way down and everything is secure. You have verifiable insecure. That means you go down the tree, starting from a secure point, and at some point you get into a zone which is not signed. And you know it's not signed because the parent says, this zone is not signed. Verifiable and secure. You can, based on your policy, you can go down in there and, and uh, well, do whatever with the data you want. It's to be honest, and your data is bad. Bad means either the signature doesn't check out or uh, the parent says this zone is secured and you get unsigned data. Then you should discard this stuff as bad. Throw it away. Don't keep it in your cache. So once again, um, secure entry point is a, the point where you say this is a, a secured part of my route. 
theory, that should be the dot. But if you deploy this on your or in your organization, you will want to depend on your uplink. So you also um, do your corporate. Uh, you put your corporate uh, uh, key in the in the trusted key statements. So that if you lose connectivity and you cannot get to the key of root, you always have your own um, uh, key configured there. And besides, you don't have to work the tree every time. Um, that's a secure entry point. Um, there's signatures of common net, so those are both verifiable and secure. Um, there's a null key introduced between net. That means that money.net and os.net is verifiable unsecure. Um, there's a sigma for kids. That means that kids.net is uh, verifiable secure. And that's basically it. OK. Well, basically what it boils down to is that the parent has to sign the child the child's key. And you have to be very careful when doing that. You have probably a, a relation to your to, to your to the people you delegate your phones to. But if you get a key from them, you really have to check their you know credentials. Um, basically know that you got the key from the person who's actually responsible for maintaining that zone. Data, not even the server with its own data. And you basically need uh, out of band DNS uh, uh, identification to be able to do, to do this securely. And if everybody on the internet would do this uh, at some point, you basically build a pretty good DDI. But of course this is local policy. And some people might, might just say, okay, I accept, I accept every key. And that's why I don't think that the DNSSEC is the perfect PTI, because there's no real set policy on, on how to, to check credentials of the person you sign the key off. There could be, there could be that facility, yeah. You, you can still use it, but I, should, I wouldn't put, like, very hard trust in it. But then again, I don't trust uh, X509 certificates anymore after Ferry Sign handed out a couple of uh, Microsoft uh, to a stranger. That's absolutely. Easy. It's it's the only thing is there. And although it's not you know like strong or you you cannot really check the policy, there's no single policy, there is a way to get to keys. And it's the best thing you have is that if this get to so this is basically, you know, operation, an operational issue, um, and I would vouch for some sort of minimal policy, but I don't know how to get that into the internet. And it's outside the scope of the 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 scope of this talk. The, 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 the um, so we have we have built a chain of trust, and. Um, I have signed my key and uh, uh, my child's key, and my child has signed my grandparents' uh, 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 grandchild's key. So I can basically walk the chain across. It's a nice so stable situation. What's up? Unfortunately, unfortunately, you have to occasionally change keys and re-sign your data. And it also means you have to re-sign your, your child's key. Mm -hmm. Why do you need that? Well, you have to keep your privacy. Private. Um, there's two things I in, think in public so. Uh, is, uh, which means it's difficult. Um, you have to keep your privacy private. I don't think there will be public much of a public. problem. He should be that. Both pushed. are not easy. It's not easy to get Thanks. your public key out in the system in such a way that everybody identifies you with that public key. And it's not easy to keep private keys private. They live on disks or wherever or on smart cards. So they can be stolen. If you have a disgruntled employee, they can just get your key and run out, run away with it. Um, and you don't want to expose it to the internet. So put your privacy key somewhere in a bastion house and, and do something smart. So that's basically a system, protect your systems. Um, but private keys can also can also be gotten to with crypto analysis. I'm not a cryptographer. Um, but you, you know, random numbers of computers are semi-random, or it's hard to make a good random uh, generator. And sometimes people just screw up making one. Um, some um, public key algorithms have, have the property that they can leak information if you overuse the key. Uh, again, I stand corrected if somebody in a paragraph says this is not true, but that's what I learned. And you can just do brute force attacks, you know, public keys get Correct. Uh, if the views get bigger, your keys just move. 
get bigger. So you cannot use your key for 10 years. Not subliminal, subliminal channels. Um, I think they are related, as far as I understand. I, again, I'm not really into that stuff. Oh yeah, this is just like if you really want to be a hacker, you find the uh, analytical problems to the uh, analytical solutions to the NP problems. That will get you a Nobel Prize or a put it from the NSA. <laughs> um, to minimize the, the impact of private compromisation, you basically. Uh, uh, you basically uh, 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 make make a short validity on your on your signature. You re-sign your stuff. As I said, if your key gets stolen, the only thing to protect you is is short signature time. Expiration. Yes. The key itself, you know, people can regenerate data, and this is something that a parent does to each child. That that makes this stuff different. And you do a regular key roll, you replace your keys so now and then. It's important to know that keys can live in the DNS forever. You make one now, you publish it, it might pop up over ten, in 10 years. It might live in some strange cache that I don't know. It can pop up. Again, this is the, the, the signature lifetime. And um, Depending on, on how you do your implementation and your procedures, you can have pretty pretty short signature lifetimes in here. You can use the key for a very long time, but you just re-sign your zones every day, or every two days, or every, day, every time you, you change data. I think I'll get into some details here. No. No, so it's a timestamp which goes uh, to the minute or maybe the second. Uh, but then again, seconds, you know, you have to just empty the In RC2535, um, what, what, is, what is not a problem with being at the very moment? Um, basically, a key needs to be signed by the parent. This is Apex information. So uh, in my um, situation, I have write.net. I have a key, write.net. The signature needs to be made by net. But the SIG has a label write.net. Now, you can publish data with a label in the Apex, so that's the top of your zone, in two places, at the parent side and at the child side. Data that's published at the parent site is the Apex, that is glue data. It's considered glue, which is um, which might lead to confusion. So data which lives at the child part, the servers that serve data from the Apex, if they are ch the children, if they live on the child side, they they are authoritative for the data. If they are parents, they are not authoritative for it. The data. If you ask a, a, a server for an NS record, you get a back of delegation that's non authoritative data. If you ask a, 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 a child for the NS record of the of, of, of the complete in the APEX, so I ask www. Uh, I ask right of that NS, I get authoritative data. If I ask the DTLD server net for right of that NS, I get non authoritative data. This is um, maybe a little bit Detail, detail, but it's kind of important because it means that the signature, which is made by the parent, has to be published by the child. So what you need is basically, I create a new key during a rollover. I put that in a key set together with the old key. I make a signature myself. I self-sign this whole lot. I send it off to my parent. The parent has to sign this double key. I get it back. I publish it in the DNS. When it's published in the DNS, I can remove the first key. And you do that because otherwise caching will get very nasty and you might be, you know, away for, for the rollover. So you have to do this tricky part of first adding a key, getting it signed, publish it in your, in your, in your own zone, then removing the key, re-sign it, get it back to the parent. Parent has to sign, sign a key user's record set with the old key removed, get it back down. You see this is complicated. 
This is nasty, this is complicated, this is an operational nightmare. And if, if .com wants to do this, well, they need another call center and you'll see your, your, your prices increase there. Um, so this is complicated. And um, it complicates it. You have complicated operations, but also complicated policies. Because the signature is made over key resource records. You, have, you can have multiple keys in your array. For Red Hat, I can have my zone key, but I can also have my IPsec key for my IPsec gateway. I can have an SSH key that is used for general personal whatever. And it might be that my parent says, yeah, I'm not going to sign uh, application keys. I only want to sign zone data. Well, that's not possible. You have to sign a whole two reasons, right? So, so it might be that you know your parent says, I, I don't want to go into the liability of signing IPsec keys. This is a problem. And say that the parent has a key compromise. The thing, so this is an emergency key rollover, as it's called. The parent loses a key. This company leaves in the middle of the night, takes away the private key. This is discovered middle of the night. What I do as parent is I immediately flush all the data from my name search so that nobody can get it. I mean, this is just these proge procedures are not really boiled down here. But you flush your data, you generate a new key, you start signing your new records. But wait a minute, all those key records, all my signatures over my children are published by my children, not by me. So I have. 20,000 delegations. And in the middle of the night, I have to contact 20,000 um, uh, system admins to say, I have a new signature over here. I'm sorry, my key got nicked. Uh, somebody ran away with a smart card. Can you, can you please replace that key? Otherwise, you're bad. Otherwise, you cannot be reached. Well, this is, this is not something you want to do in the real internet. Even if you keep all those child records on, uh, on, in, your, in your local database, so that you don't have to actually query from them from the DNS, you're smart enough to keep them locally, you still have to push them out. Um, there have been a couple of cycles to, to cope with this problem. Guys from Atlanta Labs, and Nick Steven, for instance, who is here, um, have come up with an idea to, to basically say, OK, well, let's put the signature over um, over uh, over key re re uh, uh, over key of a child at the parent and make the parent authoritative for that. That introduces all kinds of complicated problems. And what is now on the shelf in the ITF in draft form is a PS record, which basically is a pointer. It's published. The parent is authoritative for this data. The child is not. This might this is not like standard DNS. It might create problems. People are thinking about can this be done? But basically, I have. A DS record, which is delegation signer, which says this key at the child is going to do all the sign signing. It's a it's a hash over the key material and basically um, and it's signed by the parent. So what the parent only needs to do is keep you know in mind what all these these keys are in, in at the, at, the, at their children, which are used for further signing of the zones. There's no key material at the parent. It's further signing of the zones. And if there's an emergency rollover then, well, you just publish DS records with a new signature. Much more easier. And it also uh, uh, makes key rollover easier. Because you only have to upload your new key uh, to, 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 the, to, to your parent and say, parent, can you please resign that? It's a one-way interaction thing. And you just have to look at if, if, if that, that thing, the, uh, the DS record being resigned appears in the DNS. And, you, and you, your rollover is basically done. So, unscheduled problem, uh, uh, rollovers, I already talked about They are bad. There's no solution. If somebody gets away with your key, there's no real solution to that. It might be that you and all your children get bad. Well, imagine the root getting bad. You have to reboot the internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, key splitting would be a solution. Uh, the gentleman here says the solution here on operational grounds would be key splitting. Take several keys and uh, only if they're joined together, they, they can make up the signature. Yeah. Um, the tools to do that are not yet available. 
Bud, Bud. Perfect. Um, the question is, if you if you lose that key, what to do with your children? Are you going to remove the signatures, make them verifiably insecure, so that they they are still there, or are, are you going to make them bad? Because somebody else might have your secret key around and might still be spoofing data on them. So the problem is there is no remote key uh, uh, mechanism. And if you if you do DNSSEC, think about this. Have a procedure on your shelf. You're cold in the middle of the night. You don't want to think. You want to grab a piece of paper and go like, I did thinking yesterday and I wrote it down. You deal with these kind of things. Think in advance, not at the moment that something happens. Some final words. Stuff is still open with uh, with DNSSEC. Um, as I said, the yes record is now currently um, discussed in the DNSX mailing list, which is namedroppers at ops.itf.org. It's made a major list. If you join that mailing list, you, have, you can have some influence on the development here. Um, it's idea work. The semantics of the next record might be changed. Um, the guys from VeriSign has a, a little bit of a problem for secure, securing big zones. They don't want to put next records in their complete zone and then sign it. It will double and triple their zone size. And they have kind of problems with that. Um, basically, it's now on the table to change the semantics of the next record a little bit so that it's not authenticated denial anymore, but uh, basically it gives a security interval. If you want to know more details in the opt-in graph, which is on the uh, DNSX um, mailing list. Rollover of set of even configured keys. Uh, basically, I, I showed you if you have you know, a corporate organization and I want to trust the corporate organization, I have a trusted key configured. There's no way that I, as a zone administrator, know which client has have their uh, uh, keys, which client has my keys configured in their uh, in their in their uh, resolvers? So if I do a key rollover, I have to make sure that they know that um, I wrote the draft on how to do that. Um, basically, look at new keys appearing and verify the new key against the old key. Very simple. Operations are cumbersome. There's little documentation. Uh, there's a chapter in the in the bind four book. Um, there is very few tools. Basically, bind tools is, is everything you have. Uh, if you want to do more, you have to, to write your own, basically. And um, <coughs> you can use the, uh, the, the libraries that come with bind for that. And on the Digi webpage here, you find a link to uh, some patches to NetDNS so you can hack away and grow. Being a second dynamic update, it's hard. Actually, I don't know of any organization who did that. Because you need to see the key online. And that's something you don't want. Maybe you can do that in a small delegated zone, but still this is hard. And somebody did it for the common scene, I want to know. What is our plan? We have the right to secure our authority for a few pieces of DNA tree. Am I? Let's see. I said that. One needs to have the secret key online to do dynamic updates. Yeah. What are our plans? We are authoritative for a few top notes in the United tree. And actually, that's a nice place to be. Um, delegations in the United tree follow allocations. And allocations are sort of nicely defined if it comes to author uh, authenticating who is you know, the next step in your in, in, in the <coughs> chain of custody. Before we want to do that, we want to have a stable DNS stack, and it's just not stable. The VS record is still being worked on. It's not going to happen yet. But as soon as DNS stack is crystallizing to something which is like ready in protocol sense, and if there is a stable implementation, we want to try and do it. Basically, sign our zones and then spread the word on the NSSEC and have, have people who do an editor sign their zones. And then maybe we can fill up the editor tree in the right area with uh, a fully signed editor tree. And then the IPsec guys can be happy because they can put their text record with their special keys in there. 
How do we do that? Well, we kind of um, uh, spread the word on it by organizing a couple of workshops. Uh, who talks like this? Um, we have a workshop tonight. I'll get back to that. Um, and we publish some stuff. Uh, again, this is the, the URL. How to play with this stuff if you want to? Well, download Byte. It's on the Internet Software Consortium website. Join one of the ongoing experiments. The, if you have a .nl uh, um, domain, you can actually test that securely under the .nl .nl experiment, which is NL that's doing this. Uh, Keys, Karen, .net. Karen is, a, is a research facility that plays with this. Um, I tried this link this today, but it was done. I'm not quite sure if it still is there. Sigz.net is also doing an experiment. So if you want to play with um, secure domains, go there and search a little bit on the web. Um, you can build your tools yourself. You use my slide with Resolver Library, or you can use NetDNS with, with, with add-ons. We have a workshop this evening. Um, it's from 7 to 10 um, in, the, in the workshop then. Um, we just got to sign zones. Basically go to T6, sign in your own zone, uh, configuring your organization trusted key. I'm going to try to do some uh, uh, zone authority stuff using the classic style, so with a big key impression. So. Um, if you want to join in, it would be so nice if you come with a compiled bind 9 and a, a, a unsigned zone file, which you can just you know use, that we can actually uh, spend a little time on configuring everything. Check dnsec.phenomena.org for the last minute details on this on this workshop. Um, okay, we're just going to add lib a little bit there. Dot yeah. ml, excuse me. Oh, that would be dot ml, well you remember that. Um, <laughs> what did we learn? Well, we can protect the DNS. There's a DNS sec implementation, TSIC for servers, and it's the data is protected by a SIG and a key and next. TSIC you can use today. You don't use TSIC to communicate with your secondary or TSIC to communicate with your master if you have a secondary server. Well, start doing it. It, it saves the internet net from attacks, basically. Uh, the DNS sec main difficulties are, are basically keeping the private key, uh, uh, key safe. Make sure that nobody gets out there. Distributing the keys if you do trust the key configuration. Or following the chain of custody that's just not ready. And that makes the DNSSEC you know, not really ready for production. But we the first out there to have played with this stuff. Pfizer will be available from this website in say half a week or so. Um, uh, if you want to know more, um, go to the right net, 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 net site or to the Analabs website, which is a, 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 they maintain a very good repository of the stuff you want to read with, with all the links to the work with it. I had time to 1720 and I think I made it. Yeah. So that was it.
not only is it potentially something that could wipe out any possibility of that's really mixed wide, isn't it? But simply denying the connection from machines that have been part of an authenticated cloud, but it also means that it could be tracking and cloud analysis of people who are in trust work groups with each other across the sort of network branches and uh, you know, cataloging you know, individuals who can you discuss really things with each other. Mm -hmm. I didn't really think about these issues, to be honest. And I think this is a good technical tool, but um, if there's major worries about privacy issues, um, yeah, of course there's major worries about privacy issues. I'll, I'll drop at the cypherpunks uh, uh, tent and, and we'll talk. I, I, I want to know more about this. There was a tent one there. There was a record, for example, the key record for www.rightlock.net where it says that it, I can get the parent key from rightlock.net. So is that a must that I get the parent key from the parent according to the DNS system? So if he can ask such as the parent in the DNS system. Um, there are possibilities to do out of zone um, signing, but I don't know any implementations yet. Uh, it's very hard. Can so different administrators or yeah. clients could agree on, on one uh, parent? The, there are problems yeah. with, with creating loops, um, and I don't know of any implementation which does that just because of that. And I, I really have to go back to the draft to see just how and if it's specified. But I think it's possible to go to another signing authority uh, as long as it's containing less labels and I think even inside the tree. But I'm not quite sure, I'm not 100% convinced of what I'm saying here. So there's no implementation yet, and you can always establish trust with trusted keys in your result. So, um, that's it. Um, the question is, is there is the time to, to live signed on each response? The answer to that is it is not. The time to live is, um, um, at the moment the data is created, the data is signed. That's the only time it's really signed. It's not signed um, dynamically. And since the TTL counts down easily on caches, that's a part of the, the thing that is really not touched. You cannot see what TTL is if it comes from, I mean, you cannot trust the TTL from the cache. So that's why the original TTL sits in the SIG record. So you can replace that, do a consistency check on, to, to check on the TTL, basically, to see if nobody spooked the TTL to a higher value. If that happens, you, you have to minimize the TTL to the original value, and um, to verify the record. No, the TTL um, is only for caches and, and, and uh, the verification and the, the, the period the signature is valid has always, always has priority. So if you have a one month TTL and a two day C, your data will not live longer than two, two days and then it will expire in cache. Um, I don't know of any groups who did 
dynamic updates with uh, with with uh, with the DNSF. This is really something that's on the list. It's one last week on the ITF. Actually, people got together and said we should test this. And probably there will be a workshop of some group of people uh, sitting down together and just do dynamic updates. And see if we can make it work in some sort of secure way. And if you can do dynamic updates and your provider provides the way to dynamically update your key, then yeah, you can do this. Uh, should work with, uh, with IPv6, um, although some 